Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this event at the Lockdown Lit Fest. Zhao Lu Guo was born in a fishing village in the south of China. She then studied film at the Beijing Film Academy and published six books in China before moving to London on a scholarship in 2002. A concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers was shortlisted for the Orange Prize for Fiction, and 20 Fragments of a Ravenous Youth was longlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize. The English translation of one of her first books, Village of Stone, was subsequently shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize and nominated for the Impact Dublin Literary Award. She is an extraordinary novelist, short story writer, even science fiction writer, and her novel, The UFO in Her Eyes, was made into a feature film with German and French production, which was directed by Zhao Lu herself. It is with great pride and great pleasure I now, I'm allowed to say, Zhao Lu Guo, a very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest. Thank you, Paul. How are you? And where are you locked down? Where are we talking to you? I'm fine. I'm in London. I came back from New York in March, and so stationed here uh, for, for the future, for forever, probably. <laughs> forever, it's for, forever, until we're allowed to get out of the house again. I'd like to take you back, if I may, to your first book, which was just an extraordinary work, uh, Village of Stone. Um, can you talk us through, actually, let's go back before that, where the will to write came from, what turned you into a writer, into an artist, and into a film director, after what was a very difficult and tumultuous <laughs> childhood in a, in, in a small village in China. Can we start from your beginnings and your childhood, please, Xiao Lu? Sure. Paul, you mentioned the village of Stone. I think that's how everything began um, in, in that village. That's my first novel, but it's a really fictionalized um, childhood and uh, later years. Um, I grew up in this fishing village called Shu Town, which means stone pond by East China Sea. And I guess it was very intense early childhood for the first seven years. Uh, without being with my parents and I lived with my grandparents in this castle-like, very narrow, sharp, uh, kind of edged. Uh, the top of the, the house is kind of um, pointed, uh, A-shaped, full of pebble stones. It's it's kind of, um, it's slightly like, like a prison, narrow house, very dark, facing the sea. But uh, all my memories somehow, you know, contained in the house and uh, it's a very violent childhood but I don't think now it's a unique experience because thinking about all the children that was born in 60s, 70s, um, just before one child policy because their parents were away in the factory or in the army and we were all kind of end up with grandparents until the age go to school then I left uh, but I that was the beginning. I somehow spent either in that stone house or on the beach. It's not the modern beach with, you know, with the sunbathing thing. Um, tourist is just a fisherman, really, dragging the boat, uh, trying to sail the fish after the, the their trips on the, on the sea. Um, so it's very um, crowded, polluted seascape I had. And I wrote about that later on in Village of Stone. I mean, it sounds... I mean, it sounds dreadful. I, I'm not quite sure I have the words to express it. But your father had been sent away to a labour camp. Your mother was will, working full time at a factory, if memory serves, and performing revolutionary operas. There was no one to raise you. So a, a peasant couple, I think is how you describe them, took you to live in the mountain village where you stayed for two years. They couldn't feed you. So age two, they gave you back to your grandparents who lived in this small village, uh, fishing village, Shitang, um, where there were lots of widows because the men were fishermen women wearing black with bound feet. I mean, we're now in 2020, and this seems almost medieval, but this was your life to begin with. Do you, were there any happy moments in this? Was there any, I mean, for a small child, this must have been an appalling situation. Well, I think I didn't have any comparison. You know, when you had an alternative choice or examples, then you, you are longing for a different life. But then in my case, I, didn't like what I have and uh, a certain kind of fantasy in me when I was young. But but it, traditionally, I think in Chinese culture, say, you know, people live by the seaside, has this kind of imaginative longing 
thinking, you know, on the other, on the other side of the shore is something beautiful, grand, and romantic. Or, but then if people live on the mountainside, they are wise. They are not try to surpass that mountain. So it's this kind of traditional way of thinking that the mountain people and the sea people. And I think certainly I'm sea people. Um, and I I wanted to to get out when I was young. And unfortunately, when I eventually met my parents, I discovered my father was a landscape painter, and that was huge influence, um, yeah, for my whole growing up. It must have been a hell of a moment. I was incredibly moved to read that you met your parents for the first time age seven years old. You were seven years old and you went to live with them in a communist era compound. Can you explain a little bit what that was like, how that felt to, to meet your parents at the age of seven and then to live with them in this extraordinary situation? Mm. Well, it's, it, it was like uh, leaving very feudal traditional bound feet grandmother household, you know, suddenly stepped into extremely communistic uh, communal living with my parents. We live in this compound yard with guards on the on the front gate. And each time we came in to the gate, um, there's a salute, 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 you know, salutation from, from two guards with guns. But it, it's actually kind of peaceful, you know, maybe image you know, in your head is something like strange and odd. But, but once you enter the compound, yeah, there's buffaloes. There's, I remember there are white goats. There's white goat um, came up and down in our building. And then there's kind of fields, uh, wild fields. It used to be uh, kind of wheat fields. But then later on, you know, it's a factory compound, yeah, they became. And uh, my mother would be working in the silk factory very, very nearby. You can go from the back of the compound yard. And we, no one had a bathroom or toilet. So we use a kind of uh, the whole bathroom system, a squatting system in the fields, which you cross streets. So in, in that compound yard, you find three streets, a factory and a cinema served for the whole, you know, collective, um, you know, the whole family life. You get everything once you enter that gate. So it's strange, you know, everyone see everyone, no one ever locked the door. Um, I remember all the dinner and the lunch eating outside because the kitchen's tiny, tiny, like a little cave um, and uh, very dark with all this naked electricity bulb uh, hanging on the ceiling. Um, so. Everyone has had exactly similar kind of life. You know, mother would be in the factory, and the mother would be, uh, father would be working in the, in the government work unit. So it's a life like that. And uh, for me, it's kind of visual demonstration how I kind of cut off from primitive but naturalistic seascape. You know, everyone was fisherman or farmer. It's very interesting. I think later on for me to become filmmaker. Because I think that visual uh, existence was so strong in my memory that I tried to capture the two existence, you know, one's agriculture, one is factory, mm -hmm. communistic, collective life in my films. And that's an interesting contrast. If memory serves, you went to, you were in your late teens when you went to Beijing to attend film school. How did that happen? How did, how did you transition from this fishing village and then this camp I know that you'd met some art students on the beach in Shitang as a very young child, and that in your teenage years you were starting to read Western books, which, which gave you a sort of sense of rage about your own childhood. And somewhere in there, it strikes me, was the trigger that made you realize you wanted to, you, you wanted to understand film, you wanted to work in film. And that's what mm -hmm. led to the move in Beijing. Have I got that right? Yes, you're right, Paul. Uh, I, when, I, when I lived with my parents, I was trained as a calligrapher and an ink painter. Right. But I was very young in my teenage years. I was not content. I remember uh, if you study Chinese traditional ink painting, you're not allowed to use color. So I think mm -hmm. the only color I was allowed to use is a certain kind of green we call hua qing, so meaning flower green or it's kind of stoneish green uh, color from natural stone. You know, my, my father would uh, grind that stone. Uh, that's only kind of natural color you added on to the traditional ink wash painting. And uh, I think as a young girl, I want a narrative. I want a story. And for me, this is not much storytelling, you know, in that kind of stoneish, you know, landscape. Um, also, we didn't paint much figures, you know, figures kind of Western kind of 
crafts, you know, in their painting, you know, look at Renaissance painting, you know, beyond the kind of my imagination, how do you, you know, only have figures in a way, it's very strange for, for ink painters. I so was very unsatisfied and I wanted to write story and that's how I began write stories and, uh, and poems, but also some sort of visual story. And I thought that to, to marry you know, the visual elements and the storytelling would be cinema. And that's in the early 90s. And I just had this wild idea. I had to leave the whole province, go all the way to the, to the capital to study filmmaking. And uh, I remember, I think my, my compound yard, they were saying, oh, that's very technical um, profession. You know, we only have, you know, we have a dentist living in this compound yard. He's very technical. And you're going to become a, a woman filmmaker. That's more than, you know, complicated than being a dentist. <laughs> Something like that. And was filmmaking more complicated? I mean, it strikes me this is a, a, you know, a massive paradigm shift in your career. You're living in a, in a huge urban metropolis. You're involving yourself in sort of radical art movements. Things were very different in the 90s compared to now. Was that a, an awakening of sorts? Yeah, I think it's, it's all this kind of uh, radical contrast and a clash, you know, build a person's, you know, let's say taste or style or choice of, of art form. And I think I was always doing right, you know, literature, between literature and the cinema. And somehow the, the artist I always kind of very much in love, you know, say, you know, Duras or Godard or, or Pasolini or Fassbinder, those filmmakers from 50s, 60s, they both, they, they're doing always, you know, writing novels or writing essays or yeah. making films. There's no separation between two. Or Cocteau, Jean Cocteau. I think those artists seem to offer a very natural uh, way of living. You don't have to limit yourself with one sort of expression. And also, I think in China in the early 90s, uh, I was very young in my early 20s, that suddenly opened up this all the art um, in Beijing, and they were on the ground, you know, in East Village, Dongchun at that time. So I was very naive and a desperate young artist. I tried to involve physically too, you know, not only intellectually. So that's like a teenage tried, you know, first time rock and roll music or drag, you know, something like that. It, it's very overwhelming for village person to suddenly be, you know, set free with our parents and a. Uh, went into this crazed uh, youth and a kind of intellectual discovery. Um, I think because I only spent around 12, 13 years with my parents in my entire life because I left them um, when I was 20 and I met them when I was seven or eight. Mm. Uh, so you can say the parental inference was strong, but also was kind of elusive, you know, compare the life I have lived to later on. What I'm in, I was in, always intrigued by the hinge points in people's lives that send them off in a different direction or where they're presented with a clear choice, a left or right choice. And if memory serves, you became aware of a scholarship which would take you out of China and bring you to London. What was the scholarship? How did you find out about it? Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, I wasn't particularly interested in one kind of, you know, that scholarship, which is very prestigious, you know, Chivalry Scholarship. It's very yeah. hard to get at that time. But I was applying for a few things. I think one, a film scholarship in New York, and then I think one in France, uh, one in the UK. Uh, just, uh, you know, almost like anything allowed me to come out to pursuing my, my dream or my, my study, you know. But I didn't get other, and eventually I got this one, which was wonderful. I think that year, the Chinese scholarship was only granted for two Chinese persons for the whole year. And uh, I was one of two. So I suddenly, this strange freedom and also the bleakness, you know, this kind of sudden breaking up again with my home country, and it came along. Um, I, at that time, even though I was still young, but I had a full-time job, a lecturer, teaching film and screenwriting in a very large university, I had to basically abandon everything. And I remember I had an apartment in Beijing, everything. And I left without knowing if I would return. But uh, 
all the books and the, remember the photo collections. I left everything there. <laughs> I didn't go back. That must have been such an awful wrench, Yalu. I mean, that just... I, can you explain to somebody... I mean, this is difficult too, because, of course, nobody who's ever been through that will, will know what it feels like. But when you close the door on your apartment, not knowing if you're coming back, not knowing if you made the right choice, not knowing quite where you're going to, can you try to explain to us, I know you have a, this fantastic facility for language and for words, how that feels? Um, you can say, you know, it, it, it sounded quite tragic, but uh, also it's a positive impulse. You know, I, I think I'm always very impulsive person, which can lead to disaster or some kind of, you know, great construction, you know, if you kind of bold it enough. Um, and I think in my case, my head was so full of those influence I had, you know, reading French literature, you know, reading Balzac or, or, or Jean Rouge cinema or Godard cinema. And uh, also I was very much in love with Pasolini's poetry and the film. So my mind was telling me I should go to Europe to check out if that's true, um, <laughs> to prove, you know, it's fantastic, you know, in my reading, you know. Um, also just mysterious, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're always reading, you're living in that secondary reality, which is imaginative reality, but uh, didn't have any correspondence to China or to the West. Um, so I just, uh, impul impulsive, you know, I was saying, okay, I'm just gonna stay and I have a look wandering around, uh, even though it might be very bleak and lonely and uh, helpless, you know, financially and uh, emotionally. But I think as a Chinese person growing up in the, by the, in the end of the Cultural Revolution, emotionally bleakness is very familiar right. possession. Yeah, it, it possessed you forever. I think we grow up very lonely without uh, emotional support and uh, let alone financial support. It's not even important, the financial support. Uh, so I came, and after a year, I began to write the novel, first novel in English, uh, Conscience Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers, with my very broken English then. Um, and then I began to make first film, uh, which is called uh, The Concrete Revolution. And it's a political documentary film about Beijing then was building uh, massively for the Olympics and about builders dispossessed heart and their kind of you know quite lonely life you know kind of they're just blind to the city you know just to build a state of ambition in Beijing and I think that two things made me think well I could do some art in the west so I, I stayed. I understand or have read that when you first arrived in London you found it a huge disappointment what was disappointing about it? I think this is the, the the naivety, the distance created between, you know, the literature imagination, literary imagination, cinematic imagination about England and Europe, and the, the reality. So that was early two thousand. I came, lived in the one street in in Hackney by Hackney Road in a very broken, run down house with all the graffitis everywhere and uh, and uh, it was quite scary you know when I first saw sort of mobs or, or, or sort of gangsters and I remember I stayed in the house opposite to uh, to what's this um people on the motorbikes Charles Angels uh, Ch uh, what's it um, called Hell's Angels uh, yeah sorry or, or, or Yes, Hell's Angels or Charlie's Angels? One's a TV show. Hell's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, you know, the locals explain they are actually wonderful people, but just uh, visually, you know, the, the noise, the sound, you know, the image is like sort of hell for me. Um, and also, it's so bleak, you know, I think it's just uh, your first year experience somehow, you know, shape your, your idea about the country. And I remember the beggars quite a lot um yeah. and drug dealers in that street you know and i thought well okay so dickens continued you know charles dickinson wasn't a uh, dated reference in a way and later on i actually made a documentary film called uh, um uh, late at night voices of ordinary madness which is sort of based on george orwell's down and out in paris and london and that kind of 
you know, echoing back my early memories about East London when I first came. But now, of course, you know, it's no longer that image, you know, when you come, you know, to Hackney Road, entering London Fields, Broadway Market, you say, what, where, where is George Orwell's version of East London? Yeah. This has changed a great deal in the, in the nearly 20 years that you've been here. It was 2007 that a concise, concise Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers uh, brought you fame. It was nominated for several awards, as I mentioned in the intro. It led to the translation into English um, of work that you previously written into Chinese, written in Chinese. It also sort of launched you um, to a much more sort of wider reviewing of all your subsequent novels. Can you talk us through how you dealt with this suddenly sort of being having the spotlight focused on you? suddenly being in the ether in the British publishing industry as being a writer to look out for. Was that a joy? Was that a pressure? Was that inspirational? Uh, I certainly didn't feel it's a pressure because, I mean, indeed, an immigrant without language skills, even though I wrote in English, I still see myself, you know, staggering around every day, trying to understand, you know, that this linguistic choice I I carry or continue as a writer because linguistic identity is sort of only identity for writer, for any writer. You know, if you're a painter, then that's another kind of, it's a visual skill, right? Not linguistic uh, identity. So it's more like a stimulation and encouragement for me as a foreign writer. I think that was a reason when that novel was so well received and I thought I'm going to give it a try even though my personal life then was so bleak um, very I think just under the constant anxiety and stress I didn't have valid visa for years I think for the first 10 years I was just continuing the temporary visa in the UK and then in Europe so each year I have to renew some kind of visa in the UK. And then if I travel to France, I remember I had a few writer residents of scholarship in Paris. And later on in Berlin, I each time was this huge struggle how to, you know, have, have a valid visa for me to stay. So that was constant, uh, just a doubt or hesitation. Should I remain in the West or should I just go back with, with my passport? You know, but once you began writing a second language, you try to find a con, you know, coherent um, path in your professional life. So I thought I would stay, I would base in London, but I would venture out, stay in Paris, make films, and go to Berlin to continue to find some kind of inspiration, but come back to, to London all the time. Because after that, all my novels was in English, and still, you know, today I, I write in English. So, so you ask, is the pressure? Or, I mean, it, it does me good, you know. If the first novel was rejected, then I probably, you know, do different thing. I would write in Chinese in the West, which you have double kind of censorship. You know, one is you have political censorship back to Chinese. Then second is kind of commercial censorship, which you probably cannot be easily received in the West because the way of thinking, the way of narrative is different when you construct your, your book in different language. Yeah, narrative changes. Yeah, but uh, yes, I absolutely, of course, absolutely understand that. E each, each language comes from, from the land out of which it is born and it speaks of the society in, you know, which, which uses that language. And of course, it's a huge paradigm shift. You know, as you saw everybody from Conrad, who wrote Heart of Darkness, of course, in not only his second language, but his third language. Have you mm. seen a development in your in how you approach writing a new book? So um, in 2007, uh, was Concise Chinese English, 2008, 20 Fragments of Ravenous Youth, 2009, UFO in Her Eyes. I mean, very prolific years. 2010, Lovers in the Age of Indifference, 2014, I Am China, 2017, Once Upon a Time in the East, A Story of Growing Up. And then this year, of course, you're about to launch a lover's discourse. Are you aware of a change in how you approach your narrative and what you want to say as your facility with English has changed, as your understanding of, of England and of Britain and of Europe as a geography has, has, has evolved? 
Yes, I think massively. But not only writing novels, because every two years I make one film, and they are feature-length long films. So I was just out there writing crazily and making films desperately for some reason, maybe from the early years of suppression. Psychologically, it's interesting <laughs> why I was behaving in such a, in such a way. Um, but Lovers Just Cause is this brand new novel after I made 10 films, and I think I was a bit stuck in releasing all my films, you know, fictional documentaries. I couldn't really get any distributors or commercial market take my films. And I thought, okay, I will focus, you know, to write a novel I always wanted to write, uh, especially af after publishing my memoir in, in, yeah, in my early 40s. Um, so I, when I was young, I always say, you know, one of the books really struck me or influenced me was Roland Barthes' yeah. Fragment Lovers Discourse. And at that stage in me, when I was in China, in Beijing, and I was very interested in the languages between two lovers and the implications, you know, behind those speech and uh, in the name of love and seduction and betrayal. And when I came to West, I learned English a bit and then then try to understand a bit German or French. And the it returns, you know, the, the, the idea of love through language or linguistic difference and how we try to have discourse through different languages that are the same language. So this is a constant theme. And I, this is a book I wanted to write for quite a long time. So therefore love is discourse is kind of I try to minimize any narrative or stories or even characters. So in the book, there's just a nameless man, a nameless woman. Which they both try to communicate a certain idea of home, culture, land, or landscape, and a love through three or four type of languages, or you know the linguistic foundation is sort of the character of the book, and it's sort of my ex experiment in my way of thinking how to explore the idea of language and love. So am I understanding you correctly, Jalu? Are you saying that a lover's discourse has sort of come out of, of writing the memoir, once upon a time used a story of growing up? In fact, can I ask this question another way? Was writing your memoir, was, was there anything cathartic about that? Was, was, did that sort of close the door on the past or did it open it more? Maybe more close the door because your first question asked me about my very first novel, Village of a Storm. Yeah. I wrote when I was yeah, 20 and I think I began to write when I was leaving my home country, leaving my parents, uh, home province, when I was 19, leaving my parents. And then since then I lived alone everywhere in Beijing and then in Europe. Uh, Village of Stone was, you can read as memoir, but after so many years, after 20 years being living in different countries, I thought about that experience. It's, mm. it, it's very radical experience, you know, very primitive and strong experience. And yet someone like me, completely urbanized, you know, completely living the, you know, can only live in, say, you know, something like, you know, London or New York. Um, <laughs> when I think, thought about those years, you know, it, it shaped my idea of nature and urban life, you know. So I thought I would write again in a more essayistic, fragmented way. And that's how I wrote memoir, Once Upon Time in the East. Um, it wasn't difficult to write at all. But the strange thing is uh, you wrote in a fiction way when you were very young in that book, Village of Stone. And now you're writing a, a diary, like essay, like memoir. 20 years later, you know, you, as a writer, you are aware you, you should not somehow repeat certain kind of story, even though they are so real and vivid. So I had to basically, in memoir, I had to avoid certain repetition. I wonder if memoir became more abstract than the novel. You know, in a way, it doesn't matter which book you pick up. You know, it shows certain kind of truth or reality. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's clear across all of your writing. Whether you've used the metaphor of science fiction in the past with the UFOs and so on, whether you're writing memoir and whether you're writing fiction, one of the things that strikes me and I find very striking about the bulk of your writing is that there is humour in it. I mean, unfortunately, this the nature of this conversation that we've had so far has been about some rather depressing issues, some very tragic issues, but you are not without humor. Does the humor come naturally in your writing or, or do you have to create it? 
I'm not sure humor comes naturally. You know, if I was uh, this kind of quintessential English person, then I would have that, you know, gift. You know, I, I don't think I'm a very humorous person. But then I thought, if I'm deadly serious, then I will achieve that humor. You know, for example, one of my favorite artists, um, Werner Herzog, you know, the documentary filmmaker yeah, Herzog. Yeah. It was, he has been always deadly serious and it's so funny. Um, it's almost idiotically wise. And I thought that that's the only way to achieve humor and, and a joke. But I mean, I think I wrote my books with this, such a sin, earnest and a sincere attitude that some, the result is sarcastic, you know, <laughs> sometimes. Let's come to prizes briefly before we wrap up and have a final word on, on A Lover's Discourse. What do prizes mean to you, whether in film or in, or in literature? Are they, do, do, you, do you respect them? Do, do they give you pride? Do they keep you going? Do they nourish you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't believe kind of one narrow professionalized life. You know, I really don't see that is the, the healthy way. And uh, I guess, you know, the artist I love, you know, from very, very old days, you know, Renaissance time, you know, <laughs> da Vinci, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, those kind of Renaissance men, one launches oneself, oneself into the world by practicing multiple medias. And, you know, you can be at the same time a gardener, horticulturist, you know, or a scientist or right, an artist or a normal person. But that's the only way to enrich such a limited life. I mean, our life is so sort of limited, you know, by all sorts of reasons. So I really feel it's almost the need, the necessity to to do to write novels and make films and write essays and do different things. Um, and if I could, you know, I would have nature and urban place in at the same time. Um, that's the only way it seems to 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 be on this path to happiness, perhaps. And where does a lover's discourse put you on the path to happiness? What would you like readers to take away from it? What does this latest work represent to you, Jalu? A lover's discourse is very seemingly simple and uh, almost a naive book in a way. You know, discussion about language and love and. Uh, and landscape, and eventually home. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no complicated stuff in it. But then I hope the readers see what I try to do, you know, about, the, the, for example, the authenticity of life or authenticity of art, because, you know, the sections about what is authentic art, you know, in, in this village in China, or the peasant artisans, they can paint anything, you know, from Da Vinci or Picasso, you know, in one day. And the idea of what is authentic art and the landscape, because the male character is landscape architect. So the discussion is, do we possess or do we achieve a certain authenticity in our modern life, urbanized life? And that's perhaps the very big question, you know, we are living in a second-hand experience, you know, easy jet tourism or, or anything, you know, say, you know, virtualized experience, you know, that might be authentic, is secondary reality become first reality. But still, I think our relationship to the world needs to ground, you know, to be grounded um, on the certain levels. You know, again, like Dabo, you know, the French philosophy about the, the authenticity of the, the modern life, you know, after the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that's something I do think about a lot. Many of the authors that I, we've been speaking to at lockdown over the period of lockdown have said how it has freed them up to write. They haven't had to do the requirements of press interviews, of press tours and all that sort of stuff. Have you found it freeing? Have you written more during lockdown? What have you been reading? What can you recommend to our to, to the people yeah. watching this of, of who you have discovered in terms of what you have been reading and what you would recommend? Absolutely. I mean, there's a good thing about, you know, the... The, the lockdown or, or the, the COVID-19, you know, in fact, that's, you know, if there's any positive thing is to to quiet down, to travel less, to read and to think. And if you have gotten that, that would be amazing, you know, to connect to the nature again. So I was reading some very old book 
uh, Vota is a uh, condit about the idea of nature and the garden and the, and the man, you know, sometimes man can only, you know, cultivate your garden rather than, you know, something grand, you know, which is philosophically really true. And I really felt that way. So Vota is one of the book um, I was reading. And then I was reading some actually quite old books, um, D.H. Lawrence, for example, well, <laughs> I discovered such a sensuality and intensity in D.H. Lawrence's writing, you know, again about love and uh, sexuality, which is so connected to my own writing. Um, and I thought, what, uh, how come, you know, the man wasn't or still hasn't been so recognized you know, as as hard as, say, you know, Ian Foster or, or even George Orwell, you know, so it's quite unfair, you know, what, what was the problem? Um, so those books... You know, thank for this time I'm able to to read and at the same time do my gardening. Delighted to hear that. Delighted to hear you've been reading Voltaire's Candide, a favourite of mine. Zhao Lu, many, many congratulations on the launch of A Lover's Discourse. We hope it goes well. This is a difficult time to be launching a book. We know that you have the full support of your publishers and your publicist and so on, and the full support of a very loyal readership. And we look forward to seeing the next thing that you are writing on, which I would normally normally like to ask you what you're working on now, but we are running out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, Shalu Gua, and thank you so much for sharing us for thank sharing you with so us much. how you yeah, how you, Paul. Where you are. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Shalu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. See you. See you, Shalu. So there we are. Shalu Gua, whose latest work is entitled A Lover's Discourse. If you haven't discovered them yet, can I point you to her first book, Village of Stone, which is in a fantastic translation and the first book that Shalu wrote. And then if you're interested in her more recent work, the memoir that we were discussing a little, Once Upon a Time in the East, a story of growing up, get yourself a box of tissues and read that, and then read A Lover's Discourse. They are all very fine works from an extremely fine writer. As ever, we hope that you're well. We hope that you're being careful. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, cheerio.